All right. This is episode five of the Ding Fu podcast, title Work in Progress. This is Jack. I'm here with my co host, Tony. How's it going? Hey, I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing well. So, today's episode, we want to talk about a topic that's been、uh, trending in social media lately.、Um, it's an increased amount of violence towards Asian Americans. In、uh, pretty much all over America lately, and some parts of Canada, even, I think. So, oh, yeah, yeah, at the very least, it's an increased amount of awareness. I would say,、uh, people are pointing out like instances of it happening more.、Um, it's possible it's always been happening, it's just now we're starting to acknowledge it, right?、Um, which is good. I think it's always good to raise awareness on these kind of issues. Uh, but yeah, like, how do you feel? Let's just dive right in.、Um, how, do, how do you feel about Actually, this? Actually, I was going to let you go first. Okay.、Um, yeah. You, you brought up the topic. You live in the States. You know, <laughs> find it. Yeah. And、I、I'd、guess. rather yeah, you, you get in trouble first before I do. <laughs> in trouble? Oh, it's not, not going to be that kind of podcast. Nothing too spicy on this. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be for after we. <laughs> Stop recording. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I guess this topic I've definitely been seeing a lot more、um, on my social media.、Uh, people here are pretty outspoken about it, I would say.、Um, and yeah, I think it all started I, the first time I saw it was、uh, an article about an attack on elderly Asian Americans in the Bay Area, I think. And I believe it was t- targeted due to、um, coronavirus.、Uh, specifically, since you know, the start of、uh, COVID 19, there's been definitely like, increased public outrage towards Chinese people, right? Or public、um, hate, at least online. And I guess it's inevitable that some of that translates over into real life. So, as far as I'm aware, like, Increased violence did start happening like during the start of COVID. People started, you know, like looking for Chinese people on the streets to pick a fight with and, you know, just be like, yo, like, why'd you guys start spreading the virus? And obviously, sometimes non Chinese people, other types of Asians, get dragged into it as well.、Um, but I, yeah, only in the last couple months that I think did. Like, news outlets really start picking up on, on this and start reporting it. And then we started seeing, you know, reports in New York and Seattle,、um, just, you know, across the states.、Uh, and I think I saw maybe one or two in Canada too. But yeah, this is all reminiscent of, you know, BLM to an extent, right? Where police brutality has been going on for a while.、Um, And then, towards like with, with the George Floyd killing, it, it really sparked like national outrage.、Uh, where you know, you started seeing reports of police violence towards African Americans everywhere, right? All at once.、Uh, the truth is, it was always there, it was always happening, but now there's like a huge spotlight on it.、Um, and then that's when you know, the people, the, the media, everyone. Started be, becoming united, you know, like in this in this stand, like, you know, this、uh, social issue. Which, yeah, yeah、uh, which is fine. But,、uh, <laughs> sounds like you're running out of stuff to say. No, I'm just trying to keep it politically correct. You know, I don't want to get canceled, <laughs> like you said. <laughs> just trying to make sure I'm not about to say anything. Controversial, you know, <laughs> which is great. No, I think you can say stuff that's controversial, but、um, okay, like, yeah, so for me, like, so I haven't really heard anything、mm-hmm. um, until like you really brought it up. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, like, I guess, like, I, I heard like smutterings or something happening.、Um, and then I looked at the two articles you sent me. Yeah.、Um, yeah, my first question is, like, have you like felt a difference? Like, have you experienced anything? Like, 
recently or in the past? Mm, honestly, no, not really. Uh, part of that may be just the area I live in. It's like more, it's more gentrified. It's like, um, it's, it's an area where a lot of tech people live in. So I would say like, you don't see as many people on the streets that would lead to those types of encounters. Um, but there's definitely areas of town where you, you hear about, and, and this did happen in Seattle where like, you know, Asian American, Asian people did get experience like, uh, a violent hate crime, I guess. So it does just depend on, you know, where you are and I guess luck of the draw. Um, in Hawaii, there was this one guy who was just like, I mean, clearly not sober, but he, he did say something. He said something kind of offensive, like about Chinese people. Um, but he was saying random stuff to everyone who was passing by. So, you know, don't have to take that too seriously. I think, but yeah, definitely. So how do you, how do I, yeah, I was going to say like, so how do you feel about this? Like the stuff that you've read and have you had experiences like not now necessarily, like now that you're in the States or like now that you're grown up, but like growing up, like, did you experience anything? Honestly, I think I was pretty fortunate growing up. Um, despite the fact that we like grew up in Calgary, which, you know, like looking back, it, it's a pretty, it's a pretty like, uh, white dominant, um, city, I think statistically, but, uh, I would say I didn't really experience any like cultural hardships growing up. I, I think I was always surrounded by <laughs> Asian people. <laughs> um, and yeah, I never, I guess, felt confused about my cultural identity. Whereas I have heard stories of people who grew up in predominantly white, you know, neighborhood. And they, they would be, I guess, made fun of sometimes for like stuff that, you know, they did at home that they thought was normal. And, you know, maybe, maybe they felt ashamed about that growing up. So I think I was pretty lucky to not really experience any of that. What about you? Fair enough. I guess before I talk about myself, I just wonder like, so what made this topic kind of like stand out to you or like really interesting to you? And like, what's your just like gut reaction mm -hmm. to kind of what happened? So I think it, it stands out to me because, well, I mean, this is a topic that does technically directly relate to us. Whereas other like other big topics we talked about before it's like yo know, gme you know that's that's really cool but it's not like we're directly i mean we, we okay we we had a stake in it but it's not like we were dfv or something <laughs> you know like uh <laughs> but uh sorry just uh yeah got a quick text um it it's like it's like we were kind of like observing from from the sidelines same same with like Black Lives Matter, it's like, it was a huge movement, but it doesn't really directly involve us. Whereas this, I feel like it more directly, you know, relates to, to us, right? Um, in a way, um, more so than other big, like, topics that came up in, in recent times. Um, so that was the main reason why I was interested in talking about it. And how I feel about it is, I think it's definitely really, really good that we're starting to get awareness on like Asian American issues in in North America because I feel like um, with BLM, you know, the spirit should have been like uh, increased awareness towards I feel like all minorities, right? Like issues uh, against all minorities, but it was very it was very centered around you know black people specifically. Um, which I do kind of understand, but I, I definitely saw some instances where like people try like Asian Americans or um, maybe Latinos, like different ethnicities tried like different minorities try to band together. Right. And then you had comments from African Americans saying um, like, well, like this is not your fight. You know, this, this is about us. Um, 
which I do understand to a degree because how it started was, you know, a very personal issue for African Americans that's been, I guess, just boiling over for a very long time, right? Uh, but yeah, I, I think it's just really good that it's like, oh, it's, it's, it's our turn right now. <laughs> <You know>, to... <laughs> like, regardless of the outcome, it's, it's good that people are just talking about a period. I feel like. Okay. Yeah. For now. But yeah, how do you feel? Yeah. So like, uh, I guess first talking about like my experience, right? Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, growing up, definitely experienced some racism, like uh, moved to the UK when I was nine and definitely got made fun of for like, you know, not being able to speak English for Mm -hmm. my name. Um, you know, I probably did get made fun of. I just couldn't understand them. Yeah. I couldn't see English. (laughs) You know, that's. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> that's the way to go. Yeah, can't get hurt if uh, you don't know what they're saying. Right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, like that was not nice, but it wasn't life breaking or anything. Sure. Um, sure. Like it didn't traumatize you. Yeah, and uh, I, 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 yeah, it, it, I guess race does set barriers for sure, right? Um, yeah. So when I went to like uh, junior high year seven, which is kind of grade six here mm-hmm. in the UK, I went to this really rough school. It's like the worst school. I think it was like the third worst worst school in Wales. So like if you imagine like third worst school in like Alberta or something, <laughs> kind of like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was like just full of minorities. So it was like, <laughs> I think it was about half white and half um, really brown people, like not <laughs> even that many black people, and uh-huh. like literally, like no Asians. It was like me and like two other people that I knew. Um, and there was a racial divide, kind of like they would fight each other. Oh, okay. right. Uh, like so, we had a rough school, so we fought a lot. Like I was yeah. in a couple of fights. Okay. Um, but they would fight each other a lot. Um, and yeah, it was it was interesting because. I think as kids even, right? Like that they recognized there was a race, race was a thing that divided right. people. Right. And that even though we were all just kids, and in fact, I have friends who are white and brown, and like we all hung out together and stuff too, right? Mm-hmm. But it's like, at a certain point, they'll be calling for people to, you know, go into a fight and stuff, and they'd be like along racial lines a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, That's so that was kind of my actually. experience. Yeah, that was my experience. I didn't really think too much of it. And eventually I got out, right? Like we moved to Canada. Mm-hmm. I moved to um, to Edmonton first and then came to Calgary. Yeah. And like you said, our junior high, our high school was like, what, 30% Asians or something? It was enough that you didn't feel like lonely. Like you could definitely have a friend group, you know? Yeah, that you were just submerged in your own, yeah. uh, your own race. A little bubble, you know? little bubble yeah it's like you had the fobs you had the <laughs> you had the yeah definitely uh, yeah you know like the just the i guess regular asian americans like the ones who prefer speaking english but also like yeah well you have like asian cbc's things. right that, CBC's that grew you. up here yeah most of them were like most of them spoke cantonese you right? had some because you had some whitewashed sure. ones you know that hung out with the <laughs> Uh, you had the jocks, you know, Asian jocks where they represent. You had uh, yeah, the nerds, you know. We we got we got all types of Asians that you can hang out with and not feel lonely, you know. So yeah, surprisingly, yeah, we didn't have to go through a lot of that. And I mean, I did have like instances where like people yell at me, like you sure. know, like chink or like you know, go back to your country and stuff. Right, but it was mm-hmm. never a huge deal. Um, so I guess to me most times i've just forgotten about race well not forgotten because it's oh, you don't see race you, like, like, uh... we had we had our bubble right like we had our yeah. bubble it wasn't like everyone just mixed together we had our bubble and even going into uh university we had like i still had a bubble right mm-hmm. like we went to like asian church and stuff i would have friends who were like white or black or whatever but not yeah. many um and so <clears throat> I guess what I'm trying to get at is how, like, this issue just wasn't a huge issue on my mind, mm-hmm. right? Because we had our own bubble. And uh, 
so now going back to kind of like what you're showing with like the the articles i guess of uh these like kind of like violence mm -hmm. um i i think there are kind of like two ways to approach it really it's like one which is on the individual level like story by story and the other one which is on the societal level right mm -hmm. um so kind of like you can have like george floyd as an individual story and then you can have yeah. black lives matter as like a bigger societal movement thing like i would definitely the, say like, right now it's more interesting on a societal level you know um because with with all the i guess um with all the violence towards african americans a lot of times you would you would remember you would hear about the names right being um, mentioned over and over again. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. Um, there's a lot more that I can't remember, but yeah. <laughs> I think Trayvon um, Martin. Trayvon uh, Martin. A few other uh, ones, yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I can't remember that one either. But yeah, you know. But um, I guess what I'm trying to get at is how you need to deal with things differently depending on whether you're talking about individual instance or mm -hmm. whether you're talking about something societal right mm -hmm. on a bigger scale the the reason i say that is you know like we should feel kind of like this shouldn't be happening mm -hmm. right like to these people that's just you know it's just a crime like straight up right because yeah. the one of the articles you linked to me was a guy who pushed i think like an 80 or 90 year old thai guy right he yeah. fell and then eventually he died you know and we know that like falls are really bad for the elderly right of course um, <clears throat> and so then in that instance that's essentially murder right mm -hmm. yeah. yeah you know at least at least like manslaughter or i, I guess I don't, I don't really know the legal code but you know mm -hmm. even if he didn't intend to kill that person his action did lead to that person's death and he didn't have an intention to harm right okay so that's just straight up crime now if we're talking about fixing mm, societal issues and i think you gotta go beyond the individual and look mm -hmm. at stats and that's one thing i just one thing that kind of put me off about like blm was that there wasn't a lot of talks of stats and like mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. facts it was more emotional driven and yeah. driven by like a like a narrative from one story mm -hmm. right and to me that's just not how you fix problems on a societal level but I think for most people, they just don't, most people just don't go and look for stats, right? They don't like digging into numbers and, and things like that. Yeah. Like what was the thing? Like one, like one death is a tragedy, but like a million is a statistic, statistic. right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, this is the kind of reason why I don't really follow these headlines. Mm -hmm. It's because it's, it's like okay like we see these cases but without actually looking at the underlying numbers and statistics how can we actually make a policy change or know which direction to move in right mm -hmm. because for all we know like crime like violence against asians didn't increase mm -hmm. right and they could have just been highlighted more and yeah. now they're trying to create a narrative of that it's increased mm -hmm. right that's one possibility another possibility is it has increased but with just a few stories, we don't know how much is increased, mm -hmm. right? And therefore, we don't really know how exactly to tackle it. Now, um, do you think there is kind of... something to do on a societal level? Like, I think um, if there is a societal problem, first someone has to dig it that dig that up. Like, someone has to do the hard work of actually going through stats, right, mm -hmm. and going through numbers, and then coming up with a plan from there. But let's say right? they went through stats and there was an increased amount of violence towards asian american people relative to other races what would the policy change be because i feel like the driving force behind blm was like there was an antagonist and it was it was police officers you know um it was like all cops are bastards right defund the police fuck the police uh and this was like this I think really it really helped that there was a big there was a big bad enemy the, the system that people could you know like really go after could really attack um 
here, I mean, this is just, this is like random, random people on the streets, right? Um, there's no like organization that's, that's doing this. There's no systematic, well, okay, sure, there's systematic racism, but it's, it's a different kind of racism than, I guess, cops sh- shooting people in cold, cold blood, right? It's, it's a lot harder for people to go after a single entity in this case, you know? Um, which is why I said I think the nice thing is just awareness on the issue. I don't really expect any action to come out of this. Um, but it's just good that people are talking about it, period. Okay, yeah, for sure. Like, uh, trying to target, like, some kind of policy on this thing does feel difficult, right? Like, mm-hmm. it for, for first of all, it could be transient, right? Like, after the whole COVID yep. thing settles down, yep. right? The trend might go back to normal. Mm-hmm. Um, that's and a, that's a nice like, word. That's the word we often use in uh, at work. If uh, suddenly one of your one of your metrics go, goes goes down and and your alarm triggers, you don't know why, but it just recovers on its own after twenty mm-hmm. minutes. You're like. Uh, this issue is transient. No action needs to be taken. Next. <laughs> yeah, there's no problem here. <laughs> no problem here. Uh, resolve with no, no issue. <laughs> Go next. Yeah, yeah our our action taken preemptively was able to mitigate this. Yes, our our problem. system recovery <laughs> was able to handle. <laughs> well designed. Well designed system. Yeah. Well designed. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like, uh, was it like the Robin Hood CEO when they were mm-hmm. interviewing him? It was like, was there a liquidity issue? He's like, no, no, there was no liquidity issue. You know, we, we, because, because we got all this money, yeah. right? And, and you had a liquidity issue. No, 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 no. We didn't have a liquidity issue because we, we solved it. We and got like... the money. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Don't you think, um, it's okay, kind of but... funny. They, the Robin Hood CEO kind of looks like DFV, like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Put a headband on him and took took his suit off. Like, they look kind of similar, actually. But okay. But going back to um, our actual topic. Yeah. Um, yeah. This this is why I don't really follow the news that much mm-hmm. because it's like okay, this stuff comes up. Yeah. All right, okay, and then what can I do about it? Nothing. So... Does it actually tell me the stats? No, it doesn't. Mm-hmm. Right. So to me. It, it's not the type of stuff I like to follow, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I would rather go and look into the data. And in fact, like after you told me about this stuff and yeah. I knew we might talk about BLM, I did try to like read up on it a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm halfway through this one book called Stamped and it's uh, by, I forgot his name, <laughs> but he just talks about racism um, mm-hmm. against black people. And there was this other book that I read called strangers in their own land which kind of tries to explain um sort of the position this is not necessarily about racism but you try to explain mm. the positions of the basically the trump voters right in rural america mm, so it's in louisiana yeah what what and resource do you it, use to uh read your books by the way because i was having trouble i was trying to find a <laughs> i'm gonna have to edit this out i was trying to find a copy of lifespan <laughs> on the high seas you know <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll link you I'll link you but um, how how what I usually do is I um, I use an app called Libby and okay. it connects you to library card and you just oh interesting the audiobooks that's how I listen to most of my audiobooks I just uh, I oh, borrow them interesting in the library but you do have to wait a while but if you put a hold on like 30 books right mm-hmm. they're just gonna start trickling in <laughs> yeah, there's no there's no limit on the amount of holds you can put i think it's like 32 <laughs> <laughs> okay solid yeah okay also um what i do so so strangers in their own land yeah i couldn't find all the library um uh, but i remember that hey look like so i have a bunch of random emails that are verified through schools right mm-hmm. so i went to the uoc i went to the u of a i went to say you know so <laughs> And I have a Gmail account, so mm-hmm. I've already used uh, my U Alberta, my my U of A uh, email account yeah. for two two Audible accounts, one on the U.S. server, one on oh, the okay. I see U.S. You. server. <laughs> so I had like two free credits, and I pulled out my U of C account, got another free right. credit. I mean, you, so you can just keep I making emails, basically, and, and do this 
infinitely. I don't know. I don't know where the limit is. <laughs> but it's been working for me so far. I'll keep that in mind. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. And not gonna lie, so like my Audible account, I've had for years, and I canceled because I realized like I don't really want to pay for this if mm -hmm. I can get it for free on the library. Yeah. And after I canceled, like a month later, they were like, "Hey, come for a free trial using that same email address." <laughs> I just signed up again. And I was like, okay. That's kind of funny. <laughs> wow. Dude, somewhere in your company, somewhere Some, at Amazon, somebody, someone's doing their job. Somebody made a mistake on the on that one code check where it's like, did, did, is this a new customer? <laughs> and somehow you return <laughs> true. <laughs> someone on that audible, audible team is not doing their job properly. Yeah, so, someone did not get promoted that half. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, that's uh, okay. That's cool. That's good to keep in mind. But yeah, okay, we talked about resources and actually another thing I did, and so I didn't really have that much. We, we said this topic Mm -hmm. It's just a few days in advance, so yeah, yeah. But I did try to dig into a bit, so I did uh, kind of search. I think on Google Scholar for like a paper on <clears throat> police uh, killings, I think, mm -hmm. and they showed. I think it was like two that blacks were two point four times had two point four times the rate of being killed by police than white people did. I see. Okay. Right? But then what I also looked at was I looked at the like crime statistics from the u.s government's website mm -hmm. and they show that basically uh i think black people had like so i think black people make up about 13 percent of the population in the u.s mm -hmm. but they made up about 20 about double 26 percent of uh arrests in I the see. u.s mm -hmm. and then they they're actually the same number of uh arrests for violent crime between whites and blacks. I think it was like 270K each. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so what that shows is that if you look at um, police killings per viol like per arrest for violent crime, the rate is actually equal mm -hmm. between the two races. And I mean, obviously this is just really amateurish work, you know, like I didn't look into it super deeply, right. you know, I just, but I just want a sense of what the data looked like. Yeah, yeah. But, so, you know, what the preliminary result kind of shows me is that the issue doesn't necessarily come from discrimination at the level of uh, um, after the arrest. Mm -hmm. But the discrimination, or I don't even know what you can call it discrimination, but the difference comes definitely within the proportion of a, proportion of a race that's being arrested, right? And that could either reflect discrimination or it could reflect um, just different crime rates, right? Right. We know that socioeconomic status is a risk fact, like is a predictor of crime rates. Right. Right. And so if one race is generally poorer, then they're going to have higher crime rates. I don't know and the maybe exact number, place. but I would imagine it's a it's a pretty good predictor. Um, or like the, the poor communities definitely leads to increased crime and violence. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so to me, it seems like. And, and this, again, is like amateur work, you know, like I didn't spend that much time. I didn't have that much time. I had a final exam yesterday. <laughs> oh, damn. Um, <laughs> but um, but it, it seems like that the problem happens way further upstream. Right. right? That's where the majority of the problem is. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's where, you know, if we were to fix something, that seems like where it should start. Right. Like this is like a, you know? this is like a, uh, not a byproduct, but like the effect of a bigger problem upstream, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, I agree how with you there. Yeah. That's how it appears to me, right? Um, but even saying that, I think that's controversial to some people. Yeah. Um, well, y y you can say the problem is upstream, but the problem could still be, you know, discrimination towards black people, right? Just... Yeah. Uh, maybe not in the sense of like a uh, police, all police are racist, but in the sense of, you know, the system didn't give black people a fair chance to like reach the same social status of, you know, white people. Maybe that's the argument. Yeah, you can make. it's obvious. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if I try to put myself in their shoes a bit, yeah, yeah. it's like you're born and let's say, you know, not our generation. Right, but the generation before, the odds are just they, stacked against you. 
Yeah, I mean, even our generation, like, they feel the the the, the sort of like the trickle down effect of that. Mm. But even if you go further back, right? Like, I heard, from what I remember, like, they didn't really fully end slavery and stuff for a very long time. So, you know, the older, like, look. So, I mean, just putting myself in their shoes, trying to put myself in their shoes, it's like, you know, me growing up, right? If I knew a parent or a grandparent or great grandparent, right, who was, you know, a slave and, you know, they were free, but they had all these issues barriers still right like you know there was segregation and then there was uh discrimination right like you just started off way behind yeah right and then you see all these other people and they say like hey like you should be doing just as well you know i would feel kind of pissed too for sure for <laughs> sure yeah um but then but then the next part is i think where i differ which is that like, how do you solve that problem, mm-hmm. right? Um, I mean, I haven't thought too much about it, but, you know, we talked a little bit about how about how this issue, like BLM, didn't really affect Asians directly, mm-hmm. right? But in some instance, it kind of does, right? If you talk about, for example, affirmative action, right? that definitely affects us. Because what that does, right, like, is it kind of sets a quota, right, of admission to like university based on race, yep. right? And we know that like, so when I was applying to medical school, right, like and looking at like American missions, I think they do a lot, some schools do use, use a bit of a quota system on race. And then there came, became this phenomenon of like, some people were called underrepresented minorities and the other people were called overrepresented minority. So if you were an Asian person, like if you were a brown person or if you were like uh, East Asian, mm-hmm. <clears throat> then you were classified as an overrepresented minority, right. meaning that there are a lot of doctors that are like brown and Asian, right? Right, right, yeah. It's, it's a thing. This, this happens Whereas in you don't colleges it. too, um, in the States and possibly in Canada. Yeah. yeah, and then and then what that happened was I think for a lot of Asian people it just I think it was discouraging for a lot of uh, Asian applicants. Right. And like it it did breed resentment for sure. Right. Like just looking at comments on Reddit and stuff, it did breed some level of uh, for sure for sure resentment. Yeah. Oh, and dude. So, Reddit, in a way, Reddit is a whole other topic affect we can us. get to. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but it does kind of affect us, right? Um, and I think that's where something, why we need to be sort of cognizant, I guess, yeah. and I, I should probably be more cognizant than I've been, which is about like the effects of what's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, because like you kind of mentioned, right? Like, um, it feels like the, the attitude, right? From BLM was that this is for black people yeah. only, right? And that they were like, it, it's more of a thing where it's like, I, we got to get ours. You have to kind of yeah. understand what I mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And what what that does, I think, it, is it, it makes everyone want to get theirs, right? No one wants to be disadvantaged. Yes. Right? And that's where I think their approach is really interesting, I guess, in that I think it forms kind of further divides and fragmentation, right? Just among yes. all the different races. Yes. Because you're 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 asking for something um, for yourself only. And I mean, like, if I were in their shoes, I can feel why they would feel so angry, mm-hmm. right? But coming back to our own shoes, right? I think we should also feel wary of where this will go. Right, yes. because we realize that the conversation isn't necessarily about what is "quote unquote" fair, as much as it's about like we want ours, right? And then this makes everyone want theirs, right? And then everyone digging their heels, right? But on the same time, at the same time, if I were if I put myself in their shoes, I would feel like well, trying to speak softly hasn't done anything. Right. That, yes, yes. you know, before we 
protested and stuff like no one just did anything or like or at least we were still so far away from where we want to be right and so you feel that desperation yeah yeah i think but ultimately yeah, yeah. yeah we're just in this in this situation now i think that's a little bit more tense and um i think that everyone should definitely look out for their own interest right now um okay. as to not get steamed over right but any group right and also one 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 interesting observation i had was how um, you have like kind of two in a way two disadvantaged groups fighting each other right when we look at the trump voter base which is sort of like the poor rural whites right versus yeah. um kind of the more democratic um like minorities mm -hmm. right whether they're black or asian or brown or hispanic or whatever <clears throat> they're both kind of like disadvantaged groups right but they're fighting against each other <laughs> Yeah. And and it seems like their conversation never turned to like, how do we take from the top? Mm -hmm. In a way, it was like it's like the poor fighting the poor. Um, I, I don't know. That's just an observation I had, and I I feel like it's like. I feel like it's like the elites found a way to pit these two groups against Ooh, each other. So yes. that they I was going to say, talk. like, if, do you think, you know, that's what they want, right? That's, that's the plan. And also it's like, hmm, yeah, in a way, I feel like this whole thing happened because the people in power were basically asleep at the wheel or they were sort of too preoccupied with themselves to really fix problems for the lower class mm -hmm. and also the lower class had less political influence right mm -hmm. like one thing that i think that one good thing that i think that really came out of blm was like them getting uh black people to vote more right to express their their like the power that you have through voting you know democracy that's like one of the checks checks and balances right that's supposed to keep things running mm -hmm. is that even if you have less money or whatever less education or whatever that you still have the same vote as someone who's richer um anyways so it's like a blend of politics and race and i just find the whole thing really i guess interesting but also in a way scary that i can i think i can empathize with both sides right in like they both feel desperate and they both feel like they haven't gotten what they deserve mm -hmm. um but the effect of that is not coming together to come to a consensus but rather just butting heads with each other yeah right and in, and that i think is just a very dangerous environment i guess like it it doesn't feel so good <laughs> yep totally agreed uh-huh yeah, I, you know, the, the part where you said where it, the, the elites found a way to pit these groups against each other. You know, there's a whole there's a whole argument, a whole debate to be made that 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 is the point of like media these days is the elites, you know, they they control they can control the narrative. And oftentimes it's in their best interest for the narrative to be pitting, you know, um, lower class people against each other so that they're distracted right um because what's the the only thing that could harm their status is a social uprising i guess right otherwise they're they're chilling i don't know if you've seen that show um this netflix show that oh man it's called carbon something i feel like it's a sci-fi show where the concept is like, it's like way into the future. Um, and you can basically transport like your, your mind or your soul into different bodies. Um, but the whole like social hierarchy is like the, the upper, the upper elite, the wealthy have found a way basically they'll, they'll 
they'll stay alive, they'll be immortal, right? Because they'll keep, just keep transferring their uh, to new bodies. Um, whereas for people, and, and they basically all live like in a metaphorical, but also literal heaven, where it's like they're in the clouds and, uh, you know, if you're, on the, if you're on the streets, your dream is to make it into the clouds to be one of the elite. But if you're in the streets, like it's like impossibly expensive to get another body. So, you know, like if you get some kind of medical injury, it's like you're in debt permanently to try to get one, stuff like that. So I thought there's a lot of parallels between that and, you know, what's going on in society, but on a very magnified scale, right? Where like the, the, the elite have found a way to become immortal and they're so bored with their lives that they they do a lot of like fucked up stuff for entertainment. Um, and they just watch like the, the, the struggles of the, of the common masses from literally above, right? Like literally like in their heaven. Um, where they, they don't have to deal with any of these problems. And so I found that really interesting. So when you said that, you know, like the elite have found a way to <laughs> pit them against each other. Yeah, I could, I could totally see that being a thing because it's very effective. Or not even necessary. They don't, don't even need to do that intentionally. Mm -hmm. But they just have to kind of, how do I put it? Hmm... They just have to do nothing, really. They just have to like not fix any problems, and as long as the people aren't coming after them, they just like they don't even necessarily have to divert it if the people aren't coming after them mm -hmm. in the first place. Um, yeah, but what you talked about is really interesting. That that uh, t that show, I guess, the carbon mm -hmm. something. I, I I think I've seen I, I think I've seen seen it on Netflix. I just haven't. Yeah, it was, it. it was pretty big when it was airing, but um, I I can't I'm, I can't remember the name right now. But, yeah, but, uh, you know, that could be relatable to, you know, the next time we talk about lifespan. Yes, exactly. You're yes. About it, I know you said that you don't really watch, like, fiction stuff anymore, but if you have time, I do recommend checking out the first season because I think um, it was a pretty interesting watch. Like, the the plot, I don't know if you'll like it, but I did think that the dynamic with the whole, like, um, they, they had a specific term for the wealthy, too. I forget what it was, but the whole that the social dynamic was very interesting and that's sort of like i mean this has been played out before like like elysium do you remember that movie mm -hmm. with matt damon and also yep. uh i think there was a movie with justin timberlake was it just called time where like i think they had a Ooh, that does sound like familiar a, like a tattoo not even tattoo but like a display of how much time they that's had that's right oh time. yeah wow i think and i watched that, that movie and that yeah. it was like it was like a credit system, right? It yeah. was like a credit system where like you do something for someone rather than paying you money or something, they can pay you time. That's right. And that oh everything was was transferred through that that uh, one currency, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's really inter it's it's an interesting concept. I think it's been around for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it, it's funny because uh, it's like it's it's like a uh, death of the great equalizer before. Like right. no matter how rich, how poor you were, right. you would die, right? But if that was removed, now you remove the great equalizer. Now what happens? Mm -hmm. uh, it's something really interesting to think about. And would it lead to more hoarding behavior, hoarding of resources, right? Would it lead to more? Mm, mm, that's a yeah, more hoarding, more 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 of a scarcity mindset. Yeah, probably more hoarding. Right? Yeah. yeah. Let's say. But anyways. Okay. Let's, let's I was just going to say this topic for another day, but yeah, yeah. like I don't know how much more you want to talk about racism or how much <laughs> more you got left in the tank <laughs> uh, on that topic. But if you did want to move on to politics, we could, and about inequality, we could. Uh, yeah, no, I, um, I think uh, I can just conclude it with like what I said in the beginning, which is like it's it's good to just have awareness on these issues for now because, like you said. P policy wise there's not many concrete things we can do right now i think um at least without delving into the statistics but especially when it pertains to like the asian american stuff going on lately but i think just having people be aware of it will end up you know having a trickle down effect um in terms of just younger generations being more aware of these issues and becoming outspoken against them and just you know if even one person's mindset if they didn't know think about these issues would have grown to you know 
like I guess not care about them or even participate in these kind of crimes whereas because they were exposed to them at a younger age you know I think younger people are very they tend to be very um outspoken it's like woke right it's it's cool to be woke you know it's trendy to be outspoken about social justice issues so uh, it ends up you know making them very left-leaning at a younger age and yeah we'll see if that has any effect in politics right like you can already see in the democrat party where they've become very progressive um in recent years and a lot of people will blame like trump and like rural america for like the country being so divided there being so many republicans but um i believe uh, from what I can gather, a, a lot of conservatives, they're just put off by how progressive some democratic policies are. It's like they would be maybe left leaning if it wasn't for just like a few like really far reaching ideas, you know, whereas I feel like Democrats think like all conservatives are just racist, hillbilly, like poor, uneducated people, right? White trash, essentially. And so there's also a great divide there, yeah, politically. And I guess, you know, that's that's our transition into more politics. Yeah, before we transition, I guess a few things. So first mm -hmm. of all, like, we're not really experts. So I don't think we can say that there's no policy that can institute. Like, possibly there could be something. Sure. Sure. I think that's we just fair. are not aware of it. Mm -hmm. Second of all, what you brought up was a good point of how these stories bring awareness. And that's something, like, media is one of the pillars of power, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. It really is such a powerful thing in society. Oh, yeah. And that, it, it dictates what gets put on the agenda, and it dictates what's on people's minds, mm -hmm. right? That's an important part. That's the reason why I don't really follow mainstream media as much. Um, I feel like part of it is I'm just getting brainwashed. Mm -hmm. um, and, but, but it is really powerful, and it's something that people need to think about. And I think more so than thinking about specific issues, I think one thing that I'm... I'm definitely thinking more about is how do we set up the game in such a way that it produces good results, meaning not necessarily specifically what we want to show on the media, but more so how should the media function? Mm -hmm. How should the incentive structure be made, right? That dictates the health of media, right? Because social media, you know, part of the reason why it's gotten so out of whack when we talk about uh, the social dilemma was the incentive structure right mm -hmm. surrounding target targeted ads and the attention economy right having mm -hmm. people be zombies in front of their phones yeah. was more profitable than truly informing someone and similarly right like entertaining headlines gets more clicks yes, yes. than truly informative headlines that's why you know Clickbait. when i look for stats i don't find anything in these in no. these articles because people, those people don't want to read about stats let's let's be honest right people want to yeah read those one-liner headlines that gets their blood pumping like what yeah so more so than about specific issues i guess in 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 that's you know that's what's hot right now or what's yeah. really topical i think one thing that people need to think more about is how, how to just structure these institutions mm -hmm. to make them truly work right because suppose we add something in that you know biases towards one side you know as in some later day it's going to someone else is going to come in and bias it to this other side, right? So, like, that's one thing I found democracy to be really cool was that, in a way, it acts as, like, a really good deterrent. Mm -hmm. And one one way I heard how democracy works is that it, it's not it's not so much about... Uh, it's not a good way to select the best leader. Mm -hmm. It's just a good way to make sure you kick out the really bad leaders, <laughs> is what they said. It's just making sure that, like, you know, no single person can hold power too long in case yeah. they're really bad. Okay. That's more so the function than really getting really good leaders. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was really interesting. That is interesting. Um, I think about it like that. So it kind of acts as like a fail safe. Yeah. Because, you know, people can think like, oh, you know, this leader, if he had more power, he'd be really great. He'll do all these cool things. Yeah. If we set up the system like that and the bad leader comes along, you're screwed. Right? They just take all the power and they're in power forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, anyways. Yeah, I guess we do. We did just transition into more politics. Mm -hmm. So, want to start us off? Um, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I I don't have a. So, are, are we trying to relate this specifically to Asian Americans, or is this like um, 
just discrimination in politics in general. I think we can talk about whatever. Whatever. I mean, politics, to be honest, um, I don't have a big opinion about it. It's just, it's a headache for me whenever I try to actually delve into it, especially U.S. politics. I find it really, really, um, at least the, the stuff that's presented to the public is like very just clickbaity headline grabbing you know just um like i find it so interesting that, that nowadays politicians are, are on twitter and just straight up like what trying to banter with um like people in the opposite party it's like basically how gamers will talk trash to each other in, in a match of league right but it's like happening on twitter with you know elected officials and <laughs> It's very jarring to me, but I guess that's how you have to keep your presence relevant in social media these days with, you know, your your audience. <laughs> it's like that's what it takes to get to get more support is like if you if you have a really savvy like tweet that you know comes off like, "Oh my god, like you just you just roasted the shit out of Ted Cruz." <laughs> AOC is who I'm referring to by the way. She's very good at this uh, social media game and that's why she's so popular with the younger generation um and you know the fact that she she was like streaming on twitch and stuff um uh, playing among us with people like she she definitely knows her target audience and she's playing the long game i think she's capturing like she's capturing the hearts of everybody under 18 um and you know like a couple like when she makes a presidential run like maybe 8 12 years from now even like she's quite young right now you know she's gonna have the support of like all those people who grew up like watching her thinking she's so badass because she's uh, roasting re Republicans on Twitter and, you know, streaming on Twitch. Yeah. So somehow it transitions into how politicians use leverage social media, I guess. But <laughs> what do you think about that? Yeah. OK. So I don't really f use much social media. Yeah, that, that's um, fair. That's fair. Um, but when we when the GameStop thing was going on, I did look at it and mm -hmm. I did see how, like, I think Ted Cruz at one point had said something about, like, oh, yes. working with AOC or something, and AOC was basically like, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, I don't, I don't know if I linked you that one, if, but I remember passing that one around to a couple people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was like, and I'd be, I I'd be like, happy to, like, yeah, like, work with you on this, on this issue. And then she was like, no thanks, you, you tried to have me killed. <laughs> Like yeah, like basically, Man, I don't, I don't want just... to work with people that try to murder me. Like, damn, okay, bro, like, chill. I don't, I don't like it. I don't know the any like what's the truth behind what happened. So what happened there was uh, like she was referring to you know the the Capitol riots where when people stormed the Capitol right and um, there was a lot of panic, a lot of confusion, and apparently a certain Republican were tweeting the locations of certain democrats and i don't know if ted cruz was one of them but i did see tweets from this one lady who was like oh like aoc has now evacuated this building and is now in this building. like she was trying to make like give live updates but then why would you ever do that right like people on the outside wouldn't like care and like it could only help the people who are like in the building you know what i mean like so that was the controversy. Oh, okay. Fucked up though. So, that is actually fucked no, up. No, that is fucked up for sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, she called him out, and it was well received. So, <laughs> how did man? How did you know America train to that? America. I mean, honestly, probably not even just America. It's probably like around the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know that we've seen more polarization. Like America really exports its culture, right? Oh yes, yes, yeah. Like, I feel like most most Canadians probably know more about at least young Canadians. I think know more about American politics than they do about Canadian. Dude, a hundred percent. Yeah, I think I know more about American politics, Canadian politics. It's... Same. It's just there's less less domestic uh, content. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense because the U.S. is like ten times the population, so you can have people covering so many like a wide variety of things because you have the i guess the supply in a way true yeah and you also have just i think this um like the people have been almost groomed to like 
just consume the media en masse and just talk about it, retweet it, and just amplifies, you know, like whatever, like anything that uh, becomes trending, like explodes nowadays, you know what I mean? Like, including socks, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, speaking of which, like, what the fuck happened? <laughs> <laughs> you talking about in the past week or what? Like, <laughs> in the past yeah, year like, uh, in the past <laughs> past like week or so like i i, I messaged you guys right in the yeah. chat of my my friend so my friend has said he bought in like for the no 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 so he bought in like quite early but he like you know kind of averaged his cost down to about 60 i think or something. okay 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 so he had like some first ones like 200 300 etc gotcha. up and yeah i'm buying all the way down and, uh -huh. the bottom. and now he's in the money and then he like he's or he's yeah like he set a sell order at he set a limit at 80. oh that's and right he said, yeah it triggered he said it triggered and i was like what the fuck and then and it's like 120 something yeah um mm -hmm. you know to be honest nobody fucking knows why stocks go up or down right <laughs> let's be let's just be honest man like there are some really smart people out there but everybody is trying to do analysis of something that that happened and trying to justify it with reasons but 99% of the time it's just um like some hedge fund or multiple hedge funds decided to go long right or like to, to exit their positions and that's what causes the big movements like retail traders are never going to guess or never going to be able to accurately predict like how stocks move 100% of the time um there's indicators there's trends to look at but um, we're, we're just playing against, um, you know, people who have a lot more resources, who have a lot more information, who have a lot more tools. Um, we don't really know, right? Like the, the rug could be pulled at, under you any moment, or they could decide to, you know, reallocate some money into one stock. And, uh, we're just trying to ride the wave a little bit, right? You just try to not, not predict what's going to happen, but kind of catch the, the momentum, you know, that's probably the best way to <laughs> make, make money consistently. Okay. Um, what we were talking about before, GameStop. oh yeah, it was about how social media and use of social media mm -hmm. politics, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, um, I think it's, it's an interesting concept. Like, I think, do you think uh, Trump really started, like, he definitely made it more po like popular. He made it trendy to, to do this. Uh, again, I'm not, I'm like not even close to being an expert on this stuff. Fair, fair. Um, but I mean, I definitely started to see the utility in it, right? That's yeah. why I started talking, like, that's not, def not even close to the main reason, but that's part of the reason for a podcast, right? Is mm -hmm. to get your, our ideas out there and to build, in a way, a brand, mm -hmm. right? Which can come in very useful. The in Ding Fu brand. Type of in the type of economy and the yeah. type of society that we have right now dude you know right? we talked about audible earlier if we start blowing out we're gonna get a free audible sponsorship and we gotta plug it like 30 seconds every episode we get free audible dude you don't even have to make new emails anymore <laughs> <laughs> that, that's when you know you made it <laughs> or they hear you know, that part of like we're never sponsoring these guys like <laughs> fuck that <laughs> asshole <laughs> we're charging him for every email we're gonna backtrack all these emails <laughs> But yeah, like uh, media as one of the pillars of power, yeah, right, and social media in a way. Would you argue bring... it's the most important pillar of power nowadays? Media and social media in general. I think it's always been one of the highest ones, right? Like media, Absolutely. the military, yeah, and probably like controlling resource like economic power although you could although really from i think a governmental perspective that wasn't always necessary you just needed the army the army yeah right and, and the media and you could even use the media to get the army mm -hmm. right i mean or that's, how, use that's how china media, needs. I guess. <laughs> sorry and that's that's how china needs is the <laughs> the media and, and the army yeah it's I think just now I'm starting to realize just how powerful media is, you know, growing up, I think I didn't think too much of it, mm -hmm. 
but now I see just just how powerful it is. Whether it's you wanting to create a brand for economic reasons, yeah. right? To create a strong brand so that you know you can have a YouTube channel. Oh yeah. You can have a podcast. You can have. Then you can start selling courses. You know that's what yes, you're into. exactly. You could get a Patreon. You could get like. And OnlyFans, you know. You can... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait, can we yeah, talk about? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I would just say like, um, let's say like everything you talked about. Let's put it into perspective, right? Like you could you could blow up on social media as an influencer on TikTok or uh, Instagram, right? Like, and if, once you have enough followers, you can start transition. Like you can start putting out merchandising, right? You can start putting out your own branded T-shirts or hats, or whatever. Your fans are gonna buy them. Um, you start putting out a podcast, you're going to have such a uh, like big initial viewer base. You're going to be able to leverage that into sponsorships, um, have interesting guests come on, right? Like whatever other ventures you do, once you have that initial following, it's infinitely easier, right? And it applies to business too. If you're a renowned investor, um, people are going to follow what you say and what you do. And it's like, there's some kind of like magnifying effect where, you know, if a if a notable person talks about a stock, um, people are gonna start buying it. It's almost like a mini pump and dump, right? Um, notable example would be like when Elon Musk tweets about Signal, and well, I guess the wrong stock shot up, but <laughs> you know, like, and he tweets about GameStop, and it explodes to the literal moon, right? Like the power that certain individuals have is insane, and 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 a lot of that is uh, because of media right and social media yeah that's it's 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 interesting how these technologies have allowed us to really build a whole mm, a whole system mm -hmm. around a single personality mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, because they can have a podcast, they can have a YouTube channel, they can have a TikTok, they can have an yeah. Instagram. You know what Linktree is? Blah blah blah. Yeah, I've seen those. Yeah, yeah. That's a so good way to sum up, right? Like everything, your presence these days. And, and there's a synergetic, syner, uh, synergistic effect, yeah, right? yeah. where your success in Instagram helps your success in TikTok, which then comes back to help your success in Instagram, yes. which then helps the, and and they snowballs upwards. Right, it becomes yes. more like a positive feedback loop, and it's just really powerful. Um, Insanely powerful. And yeah. I think we're, I think we're not even at the pinnacle yet because I think there are more talents out there mm -hmm. than than the talent we see in those industries right now. Um, for example, with podcasting, right? I don't think Joe Rogan is the pinnacle of podcasting. Sure. I think yeah. there, you can definitely have better hosts, mm -hmm. right? Who are more knowledgeable like he's definitely a great interviewer and he has like a really wide uh base of knowledge yeah and you know really cool experiences and he's like kind of funny right but I'm, you can get better people than that still yeah right? so Absolutely. Mm -hmm. i mean i don't think any field has reached the pinnacle of oh okay maybe i can't say any field but i think there's a lot a lot of fields where we're constantly pushing the boundaries of what we you know, believed was possible. Um, not just in like, yeah, but it gets harder and harder. It gets harder and harder. Yeah. 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 For sure. The marginal return just goes down, like, like it's just lower and lower. Mm -hmm. And, but in these sort of more nascent technologies, it's, it's still at a pretty good point. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's market market shares to be taken, right. From the big media companies. Still. That's us, baby. Market share taken. <laughs> it's extremely difficult we're we're going to podcast late for sure like it's already getting started. oh yeah yeah definitely um yeah i personally already know a few different friends who like got into podcasting in the past year or two so yeah but at least we find it fun so yeah. like i don't mind just doing it for free so <laughs> exactly you know and if we yeah. get one sponsorship out of it we get like a free t-shirt or something yeah i'll take it I don't know. I'm dreaming bigger, man. I'm, I'm waiting for that unlimited audible credits. Oh yeah, it's juicy. I'm waiting for that free Tesla. Elon Musk. You, <laughs> you watch. <this. laughs> I'm waiting car. for that free ticket to Mars. Oh yeah, yeah. Let's. 
<laughs> but it has to be a return ticket. Start plugging. <laughs> Hey man, maybe by the time we can go to Mars, you don't want to come back. You never know, man. <laughs> Who knows what's going to happen in the next uh, few years. Yeah, so was there anything more you want to talk about race? Like, okay, there was one thought I had. Mm -hmm. We're just sort of about... I'm trying to remember it, but it is sort of about this concept of... of power, of enough media. Mm -hmm. um, being, being a pillar of it. How... Actually, yes, I do want to talk about something, but uh, after you, yeah. Yeah, uh, well, I'm trying to think of it, so why don't you go ahead? Oh, okay. Yeah, so exactly what you said about if this relates to media and race. Um, yeah, again, like media is just such a big influence that I don't even think a lot of times we don't even realize consciously that uh, we are forming biases because of what we see portrayed in the media, right? Um, a big example, a very easy example that I'll bring up is how Asian people are portrayed in movies and, and TV shows. And I think we even talked about this before briefly, but, um, for a long time, like whenever you saw Asians in Western movies, they were like very quirky or, or weird, or they were kind of in like a jester role or, you know, like they were never going to be like a, like a main character um or even just like someone who <laughs> could hold an intelligible conversation almost right it was like basically like people doing kung fu and like making weird noises or like kim jong in in the hangover <laughs> um and that influences how people see um how people view asians right in in real world um i have a friend actually who on the, on this hawaii trip he's very outspoken about um, Asian American identity in in the U.S. So like he's he's American like he's yeah he was born in oh he was born in Asia but he um, he grew up in Maryland in the U.S. So he, he he's I think he's experienced some like you know racial racial discrimination growing up and he sees a lot of um, <laughs> I'm gonna get canceled he sees uh, he sees a lot of I guess like white guys with Asian girls and it's it's like a it's like a triggering topic for him like he's very outspoken about it right and like this is a big part of it is how like because of how Asian people are portrayed how Asian men specifically are portrayed in in media uh, it, it makes them viewed as less attractive in society versus like white men or uh, like Latino men or black men to a degree um, I don't know if the statistics back this up Actually, oh, there is a there is statistics. So, have you heard of this OK Cupid study that was published? Um, it was back in like two thousand thirteen or something. Um, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. I think it was like it was. But before we famous. go into that, can I just go to the washroom? I'm sorry. Of yeah, go go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get some water.
All right, you gotta find a way to cut that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll look into it. Um, what were we talking about? Um, o- OK Cupid study. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So this study basically broke down, um, I guess, a few different topics. One of them being uh, the swipe rates of uh, broken down by ethnicity, right, and, and gender. And what it showed was that for Asian males, um, only Asian females uh, had an increased swipe rate co- compared to the average, whereas all other ethnicities swiped lower um, on Asian males, right? And for Asian females, it was an increase from all ethnicities, um, biggest being Asian males, but I think the smallest being either black or Latino males with like plus two or three percent. Um, when it comes to white males, it was an increased rate from all ethnicities, um, as well. And the most disadvantaged, I think, were both black males and black females. Uh, black females was, I think, negatively swiped on by every race, including black males, which is really sad to see. Um, and black males was swiped on almost negatively by every race i think i think black females was increased and then that was it yeah um but yeah those those are the ones i remember off the top of my head um the only reason i remember this is because all this got brought up on the hawaii trip like (laughs) there's a lot of time and car rides to talk about stuff (laughs) but um yeah so I, i thought that was interesting you know and it i guess it helped confirm some biases that that some people had which is you know asian males get shafted uh when when it comes to like uh the dating pool in the u.s now i personally think it's like a little overblown i think a lot of it is like um you're trying to justify why you're having trouble like finding a girlfriend right and It, it can it can it can lead to a very toxic mindset to just like always blame it to external circumstances like oh like i i can't do anything about this like i was born this way like this is the world just sees me as less desirable right like that's a very self-defeatist attitude um but there is something there like there the odds are the truth is maybe the odds are a little stacked against you i don't think that's gonna deter you from you know being able to find a girl by any means but maybe you do have to work a little harder versus someone else right um and i guess that's 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 the whole issue is you know it's there discrimination's there it exists everybody has subconscious biases whether they want to admit it or not right so what can you do about that yeah interesting like i i've heard about the parts about the asian guys and the black girls that part I've heard about. Mm-hmm. I didn't hear about like black men part before. I can't. Uh, I might be butchering the black men part, but I do remember it in terms of men. Like they are also. Yeah. Maybe white girls had an increased swipe rate on black men. I forget. Okay. Yeah, it's. it's did you? Okay, so first we'll talk about this. So yeah, um, how do I feel about it? Part of me feels like it doesn't necessarily have to be racial discrimination Mm -hmm. that it could reflect some differences, Mm -hmm. right? This is stereotyping, but when we're talking about statistics, it is by nature stereotyping because you're talking about generalizing a group. But my experience has been that Asian guys are in general, just like not as good socially, like they're more more shy, more passive, more shy, and definitely we have a lot more at least what i feel like is we have a lot more nerds like it's you know like i think that is actually one of the major topics um of this whole like it's it, it's a subreddit called asian masculinity i don't recommend actually spending too much time on it because it's like i've seen it i've seen, seen it, it. One of my, my one of my friends goes on it and i saw it at his house so i checked okay. it out yeah, it's yeah. It, that's the subreddit that um, my friend often brings up as well, the, the one I was referring to. Um, yeah, I feel like it's a lot of the mindset on there is like, 
you know, like trying to identify why Asian men um, get shafted, I guess, uh, in the in in Western you know society. And one of the issues that could be identified is like, yeah, like Asian men tend to be more passive compared to white dudes, you know, and like ultimately, um, most girls are attracted to like an alpha male, right? Like someone who can stand out from the crowd. And someone who is less shy in a social environment is going to just naturally be more attractive, just kind of stand out more. Um, so that's one. Yeah, I think confidence. I think confidence is huge. Yeah. Um, and I don't think Asian men have confidence. Now you can argue that you know maybe it's a chicken and egg problem. Maybe they don't have confidence because of discrimination, mm-hmm. etc. Right, right. But I think there, I have a thing where it's like I think you have to. Th- you have to tailor what you say depending on who you're talking to. Mm-hmm. And this was a thing that came up when we were learning about addictions, actually. Because mm-hmm. there, there was a debate whether addiction is a, is a choice or a disease. Okay. Right? And there are arguments for both. But what I came down, what I came to conclusion of was if you're talking to an addict who believes that they cannot change anything, yeah. right, about themselves, about the environment, or about their the circumstance, then you want to emphasize that choice part. Try to squeeze the most they can get out of that person, right? Mm-hmm. But then when you're talking about setting policies, you have to treat it more so like a disease with all these, um, all these like risk factors and things that the government could control, mm-hmm. right? To set up a society in which you can treat less addicts, right? Because everything we do sort of has two aspects of things we can control and things we cannot control. Mm-hmm. And depending on who we're talking to and like our motives, I guess, then you want to emphasize different things. So if like when I talk to uh, Asian guys who you know have trouble dating or whatever, mm-hmm. I try to emphasize what they can change, right? Mm-hmm. Which is to try to be more assertive and to be more confident and yeah. get to learning how to do those things. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, but but in my opinion, there is a part of it where it's like it is a certain characteristic, you know. I don't think we can necessarily just claim discrimination. Oh yeah. Uh, just because there, just because there's a different thing, outcome, right? I think this gets to that debate about like equity versus equality, like like equal opportunities versus equal outcomes, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. Um, so <clears throat> this also links to sort of like I think there was this scandal about like Harvard admissions, right? Yeah. And I think had a character score and what they found was that systematically uh asian scored lower on the character score right and i was just thinking well like and and a lot of people were claiming uh like racial bias uh maybe like unconscious biases or overt discrimination um and i don't know i don't know what explains it but to me it could also include a bit of just our differences, right? Yeah. And that's brought up by more upstream factors, right? Whether that's how people were brought up, right? Whether that's culture, uh, or whether that's like bullying and discrimination as they were growing up, mm-hmm. right? Or media representation. But sometimes there are upstream factors that we can't solve just downstream. Imagine if we took that same sort of strategy of, let's say, trying to ensure equal outcomes for. Uh, school admissions and we did that in the dating pool and we're just like well i'm sorry girl but you just gotta date this guy <laughs> like that's just <laughs> your that's just we, we gotta fill this quota right yeah. <laughs> right yeah affirmative yeah. action in dating <laughs> like yeah but i mean oh my gosh yeah yeah can you like it just some of these things i just don't think can be really scaled up mm-hmm. and that represents maybe a philosophical flaw in the thinking, I mean, I'm not, I'm not expert in this, like I would say, but I, I, I guess I do, I do have some, you know, preliminary yeah. amateurish thoughts. No, yeah, I think that that's pretty, yeah, well said. Um, I agree with that. Um, yeah. So now this brings to the next thing, which is I actually tagged you in a post because yesterday, did you... like, so sometimes I still go on Facebook to, um, to see notifications because I'm in some groups to see if. Like, I don't just go on the messenger.com site. Yeah. Also, your camera's blurring up. Oh, that's weird. Oh, okay. As you fix that, um, what was I going to say? And then the first thing that was on my newsfeed that kind of caught my eye was a post in Solo Asian Traits. Mm-hmm. 
And I think it was something like, oh, look, an Asian American female lead in Justin Bieber's new music video. And I was like, oh, that's kind of related to what we're talking about, right? Kind of media representation right, and stuff. Right, right. And I clicked on the comments, and it was a shit show. Wait, you, you said you, you tagged me? I, ta- I tagged you. I believe I tagged you. Um, check Facebook. Oh, weird. I actually don't want to see it. Okay. Shit, that text some random jack thing. <laughs> um anyways but go on yeah yeah you can you can link me the post later yeah no i'll try to find it right now i should be fast okay and i'll try to talk as i go i guess but base it's a little bit tougher to talk as i go <laughs> but try to search search uh solo asian trades and search for uh all right i'll, I'll give it justin a bieber new new video yeah but the comment section, you know, it was just so much stuff, right? And it showed me just how much you have been thinking about this. Mm-hmm. So there were posts about how, oh, and another Asian, uh, sorry, uh, white male, Asian female. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. There was a thing about, oh, she's being used as a prop in this music video. And there was something about how, like, I think in the video, I didn't really listen to the whole thing, but I just kind of mm-hmm. scrolled through it. But I think she was like a cancer patient. Oh. Okay. And the house of people were commenting like, oh, it's a white savior thing. Oh, okay. I didn't then, think about it from that perspective. Yeah, there were just so much. It was being analyzed so much. And then there was also, you know, people on the uh, sort of other side where they're talking about like, oh, she must be so happy that, you know, she got to work with someone famous and this is good for right. her career and therefore it's good. Right. Um, and then I think I also saw people talking about how, oh, this is like Asian in the sense that it's like East Asian, you know, like Chinese, Japanese, Korean, mm-hmm. right? Rather than like someone who's South Asian. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Or Southeast Asian. Yeah. And it just made me think how, how divisive this topic has become mm-hmm. and right. how I can't find people it. That's read. Fine. Yeah, that's fine. Maybe I'll removed. Um, People just talk so much. Like, they people just analyze it so in-depth, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a huge topic in the States right now. Um, and I think it got bigger because of BLM. Or, like, the, the presence, the amount of people talking about these was, like, it increased because people were like, oh, like, what, what about us, right? Like, Asian people have been getting shafted uh, for a long time. But, you know, just because we're not, like, so outspoken about it doesn't mean it's not there. Um and yeah, that, that goes back to like how you said how how de- divisive this is. E- even you have within the the Asian community, there's already division between like East Asians, Southeast Asians, South Asians, right? A lot of Indian people probably don't even feel like they're included when people refer to Asians, and that's a whole other topic you could you could have. So. Yeah, and what this, I guess, one of the thoughts I was having was sort of, it goes back to that power struggle mm-hmm. and how everyone is looking for what's theirs. Yeah, yeah. Right? I think this racial conversation can be kind of constructed in, either, uh, in kind of two ways. One way is to set up common ground and common rules, right? And try to achieve a common goal, right? Whether we set up a, uh, like have a common value, maybe around fairness, right? Or around equal opportunity or equal outcomes Mm -hmm. or something, right? And the other one is to fight against each other for a limited pie, limited slice of the pie. And unfortunately, what I see is more so people are doing the latter, where it's becoming a more so of a conflict, a war, rather than a conversation, right? And, you know, you could definitely argue that conversation was tried and it didn't work right in the case of black people right i think that's part of their frustration is you know they they see it as like we've tried being quiet and stuff and it didn't work right and maybe some asian people feel the same way is that we tried being quiet and it didn't work and now they're just coming out for for what's theirs but what that breeds is everyone looking for theirs and I don't know where it's going to go. <laughs> and uh, frankly, I feel like it's a little bit scary. Um, what's yeah. happening? Yeah, that's, 
That's a good point. And I don't know if we'll ever get to the ideal state you described of having a common ground because people are by nature going to look out for themselves, right? They're going to be selfish in that sense and at the end of the day stick with their community, their people, so to speak. And it goes back to what you said about like when when there'd be fights at at school growing up, even though you had friends from different races, they would end up like you would end up naturally form like siding with, you know, your your ethnic your racial group and I think it just shows at the end of the day, like it's it's human instinct to band together with, you know, like people that are similar to you, right? Um, so yeah, that's yeah, that's, that's what makes that's what makes America so interesting, and I guess North America so interesting is that they're not very ethnically homogenous. Yeah, yeah, right. Melting pot, as they um, say. Yeah, America has this history of like <clears throat> immigration. And also slavery, mm-hmm. right? Where they brought people by force from Africa mm-hmm. to the continent to use a slave labor. And once those people gained rights, well, now you have a reckoning, right? Because I think in the past, in history, what we've seen is if one group oppresses another group, they're usually not within the same border. And there yeah. are they don't have a legal framework to see each other as being belonging to the same group. That's what allows mm-hmm. the conflict to happen. True, true. Right. And natural resolution of that is either defeat of one group or separation of the two groups, right? Mm-hmm. In some way. Um, and that's why we have like, you know, nation states and things like that. But America's just really interesting in that they all the while having these people who are kind of suppressed and oppressed within their country. They decided to give those people rights and power, mm-hmm. right? And that formed a really interesting, and I don't know if it's, you know, happened before, but for this really interesting scenario of having to deal with these different groups coexisting, right? And also with a history of oppression too. It's not like people came in willingly, right? Like immigrants. Yeah. And I guess we'll see what happens. But I do think that naturally people, like you said, are self-interested. And that does oftentimes drive towards cooperation too. Because you could either destroy each other or you could each take concession and compromise, Mm -hmm. right? And come to somewhere in the middle. And I think that's that's what's eventually going to happen. But in the meanwhile, we're going to have these struggles. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to take time. Um, Like African-American issues have been pretty acknowledged for a long time in North America, right? Like ever since at what well, MLK, right? That I mean that that was already um that was enough to spark riots back then. Um spark a targeted assassination, uh spark a whole movement. So it, it does it takes time, right? Society <clears throat> is aware of these issues. <clears throat> But awareness and action are two separate things, and yeah, it's gonna take a long time to even know what what can be done. Mm-hmm. In the meanwhile, I think people just need to take care of themselves, really. Uh, yeah, yeah. In because you know, if I lived in a city that were having a lot of protests and some riots, right? You know, I think first thing you have to do is kind of take care of yourself. You know, make sure you're safe and stuff glad that there are no riots here oh yeah so was there any protests of any kind um during covid like anti-mask protests yeah so there were so one one we did see some blm stuff Mm -hmm. um one time we were driving around downtown and uh we did see people with posters were on their way to gather in front of the legislature um and then there also have been like a lot of anti-masking Kind of COVID as hoax type of uh, protests. Mm-hmm. Those I didn't see like in person, but I saw videos and stuff, and they were pretty raging as well. <laughs> like just so a bunch of people, you know. I think Calgary had some that were like really big. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah, and 
it's funny because I think when it started in America, I, I remember a lot of people, including myself, were like, "Dude, what's what's wrong with America, man? Like, people here are crazy and they don't wear masks." And then someone showed me like a picture, like in Calgary, people protesting, or like dot dot dot. Like, I thought we were better than this. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's dumb people everywhere, everywhere. I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I don't know if you can just straight up call people dumb, right? Like, no, you're right. Yeah, it's um, like, can we can we really say for sure that masks work, right? Like, have we right. did we do the study? Can we trust the scientists? You're right, man. Like, can we trust the scientists? That's it. Is that's something that topic. it is something I think about because I, you know, I worked in research, uh, for over a year, mm-hmm. and I did see some what I would say questionable stuff, right? I mean, I would say a lot of questionable stuff. <laughs> that are just part of the industry standard, I guess you could mm-hmm. say, like just, you know, something that's within their culture, um, driven like by bad incentives um, and like bureaucratics, red tape, stuff like that. Um, so when people, I think, yeah, this comes down to, I think what will probably be my concluding statement on all of these things, right? Whether it's racism, whether it's politics, science, right? You have the is same that... statement for all these topics? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just that to to think about things. You know, what Andrew Yang said, make America think harder. <laughs> okay. Like, really think about things critically and don't just jump to conclusion. Either side you're on, mm-hmm. right? Because to me, it's like the anti-vaxxers, you know, they say like, oh, there are these studies that show vaccine doesn't work and blah, blah, and they have all this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. But they believe... And on the other side, which is sort of the side I'm on, but mm. also the side that I don't re- fully agree with, is they say like, oh, but the scientists say this, like you're not listening to the science and stuff, right? Mm. And these people often have literally no training in science. They don't <laughs> know how science works, yeah. right? And they can just go and proclaim that science is all the answers. It's just straight up not true. Like we saw, what was it like there were some hydroxychloroquine studies published in the Lancet or something mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that had to be re- like uh, withdrawn because it was garbage. There was something, yeah, was it like a, a gl- surgical globe, world sur- some some kind of company, I think, they said they had all these, you know, studies showing some results. I think it was around hydroxychloroquine. They yeah. published in the Lancet, I think. And when they went back and they just realized these guys made up all this shit. Like it was actually falsified, and right? Where, you, you tell me about it. I yeah, and where, where, where was the where was the self-regulation there? Yeah. Where was the peer review? Right? Like they were just asleep at the wheel, wheel, right? Like, I don't know what happened, but mm-hmm. how can we trust these institutes when they do these things? Right? I'm not, sh- I'm not saying to go to the other side and just no. go for conspiracy theory, but we do have to see things in a bit of more of a nuanced way. It's not just like science, Mm-hmm. Yes, non-science, mm-hmm. right? It's much more nuanced than that. In w- every topic we talk about, there's race, politics, yep. science. I'll, I'll go a step further. I will go into conspiracy theory territory, and I'll say that, I'll argue that almost everything you see, you read nowadays being presented to you is coming from someone who wants to paint a narrative to you, who wants you to think or feel some type of way, right? And they leverage science as a tool to achieve that as well. Right, because like you said, there's just a negative portion of people who have no understanding of how most of these things work, have no expertise or training in any way, uh, but they treat science as the gospel. Does that sound familiar to you? Sounds like religion to me almost, right? Where if you don't, you don't fully understand something, but you trust it blindly based on faith, right? You haven't done any of your own research, but you believe this as the source of truth. So. I can't, I just compare science to religion, which is kind of funny, I guess, but, um, so... It's the new religion. It's the new religion, right? And so, you're the one who, I think, brought, like, told me about this. I've heard about it before, too, but, like, people will pay for studies that have very misleading, um, that will present very misleading conclusions, right? Companies will pay for studies, and I remember this was often being said, where, like, um, sugar companies basically um, ran a campaign to. Sorry, you cut off for a second. You just repeat what you said. Like, yeah. Just the last like two. As, as I, sugar companies paid a lot of money to run a campaign, um, basically saying how fat was like really unhealthy for you, right? And 
So for a long time, we we try we treated like high fat foods as really bad, um, and it wasn't until somewhat recently where people started changing their mindset and say, like, oh, like sugar is you know like just as bad if it like, actually much worse, and that's what we should be looking into. But so stuff like you know like that's a common thing I feel like an easy example to look at where corporations can leverage science and um, academic studies to construct a narrative that may not be entirely true. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, so I, I need to be fact checked on this because I don't remember this and I don't want to like, you know, paint someone in the wrong picture. But I think it was the American Heart Association mm -hmm. or one of the doctor groups, right, who fully supported this. Right. And they like put their like seal of approval on these things that really pushed it forward. Mm -hmm. Right. That's that's why people can't trust elites. Right? It's because there, they have so many reasons not to trust them. Yeah, and yeah. we need to. I, I think with all these problems, we need to make sure, right, that the elites, the people who are on top, need to do their responsibilities, right. So, um, and and what you said about religion and uh, science, man, like definitely, like I think it was recently, just within the last couple of months, where. I started feeling the same way about when I listen to politics or listen to science sometimes, mostly politics, I guess, which sometimes, you know, takes science as a side thing, mm -hmm. um, that I had the same feelings as I had when uh, I was going to church and I was losing my faith, right? Mm -hmm. I just had the exact same feeling of like, everyone around me is getting into groupthink, right? They are not questioning what they're, what they're talking about. You know, when I went to church, it was funny. Like, I was probably one of the only people who has actually read the Bible, you know? <laughs> and so when I bring up these things, I'm like, hey, this part doesn't make sense, or like this and this. You know, people are just like, oh, like, mm -hmm. like they, they don't even know how to respond. <laughs> but they just have this implicit faith, yeah. faith, right? They say like, hey, look, like, you know, this is the word of God. But you're not even reading the word of God. Like, what does that make you? Mm hmm and I've, I've been getting that same feeling, you know, med school in a way is a bit of an echo chamber. I think I told you, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is quite politically on the left and, you know, like, you know, you could be right on the left or you could be right on the right. Right. Like meaning that either side could be right. It could, mm. they could have the truth or whatever. Right. But when everyone's on one side, it definitely makes you question certain things and yeah, I, I started to hear these sort of like just dogma being being uh, being handed around, right? That people are not questioning what they're believing and kind of jumping to conclusions and just getting mad at people who don't fit into their mold. Yeah. And I just got this, like these chills, you know, that the same feeling as I had when I went to church. And that kind of scared me. Cause I was like, wait, I thought I escaped this. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Damn. Our society does work in that way where we have these groups and they, they insulate themselves. They self perpetuate, uh, they become echo chambers in a way. Very, very well said, uh, because this happens everywhere, literally everywhere. Um, you know, and I think it it really shows like it's it's in our nature to like want to fit in to want to belong to a group a community, right? So I I would argue that uh, most institutions or groups will naturally end up forming um, echo chambers to various degrees where you're gonna have like uh, within one company you're probably gonna have very similar political opinions, uh, at least publicly, because even if you do disagree, you don't want to say something controversial that your boss might not like and get you in trouble at your job. Um, and maybe same at med school, like uh, people just want to fit in with the rest of the rest of the class. Right. And no one wants to be the guy that gets gossiped around for having controversial opinions. Um, at the end of the day, I think, yeah, people just want to belong and that ends up creating these mini echo chambers you see pretty much everywhere and the internet is like one thing that made it so much easier is where like you don't even have to do have any effort you just 
you go on Facebook, you go on a few forums and eventually like the algorithm is going to find stuff that you're interested in and you're going to join those groups and you don't even have to be exposed to differing opinions anymore. And that just validates their own views more, right? They have all these people agreeing with them. No one's fact checking, like you said, no one's questioning it. So it starts make, reinforcing those beliefs and you have more clashes, more differing opinions being met with anger and resentment instead of understanding and acceptance no yeah so i guess we're ending on a pretty sad note of like yeah that's yeah <laughs> is there is there any way we can end this on a more less bleak kind of tone you know yeah i think in the long run things work themselves out I, that's my belief I, I don't know maybe i'm just not optimist but mm -hmm. i believe that in the long run things tend to work themselves out uh, you just have short-term pain often. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, just just the fact that we're talking about this, that's just the fact that we recognize that this is a problem. Yeah. There are probably other people who recognize it as a problem. We're working on it, you know? Yeah. So we can just sit back and do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Let's let people who are smarter than us tackle these problems. And we're just trying to get big on our podcast and get free audible sponsorships. That's, that's, that's our goal. <laughs> okay. Yeah, fine. I'll, I'll say this, you know, like, you know, anyone that's listening to this, I guess, right? Like if you see these things as a problem, start, start with yourself, right? Don't, don't start by going out there and like arguing with people and like saying, oh, you should do this and you should mm -hmm. do that. Start with yourself. Um, start fact checking where you're reading, stop reading like, sensational things in the news right like start reading more books start mm -hmm. looking at more papers looking at more uh data points that that you can find right even though it's boring uh, but if you believe this is a problem then it's worth it to do that right right stay informed and question what you read and hear not if people question what they see anymore you know sometimes i'm guilty of that too where i'll see something that appears pretty well constructed and well written and um i'm more inclined to believe sorry it. jack did you say we ended no we didn't end okay sorry i thought we, i thought we we're in the postscript now oh my bad Sorry to rough your flow no do you, do you want to be in the postscript i mean i don't really have much else to say anymore <laughs> That's the end of the episode. Honestly, thought, Thanks for. I thought we were ending when you. I thought you were ending when you said, "Oh, stay informed." Blah, blah, blah. Oh yeah, yeah, cool. Oh, you know that and is I a thought, good. That is a good place to end it. You know, but that's the end yeah. of the episode. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Check us out on <laughs> YouTube, Spotify, uh, on OnlyFans. <laughs> yeah, check us out on our own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you like right. what you see, I want to see more. You know. Yeah, if you want to see the R-rated version, the non-redacted version. I'm just going to edit out like half the things in here and put the rest on OnlyFans. <laughs> That's our business model right there. Yeah. Anyways, thanks for tuning in. See you guys next time. Peace. Peace.